so let's go ahead and get started. We'll talk about what Magnum is a bit. Um, so first of all, I'm employed by Cisco Systems, and I'm a principal engineer. I work mostly on OpenStack and also container technology. I'm bringing containers to OpenStack on behalf of Cisco. That's really what my personal mission is. Uh, how Magnum fits into this is Magnum is a container as a service solution. Uh, let me tell a story about how Magnum got started because I think that's very interesting, uh, at least to me. If you go back to the uh, Portland, uh, to the to the Paris Summit, uh, during the Paris Summit, Docker was a really hot topic for, of discussion. People wanted Docker and OpenStack, but nobody really knew how to add Docker to OpenStack. Nobody really had any idea what to do with Docker and OpenStack together. Uh, so Adrian Otto, who's a PTO of Magnum, um, held a session, a, a one-hour session, talking about what the design goals of Magnum should be, where they named the project. Terrible name, but it does what it is. Uh, they named the project, and they decided that it should be a containers as a service project, but they didn't really know what that meant. And the Nova guys, if you're familiar with OpenStack, Nova is a compute service uh, as a service solution. And the Nova guys were really negative towards containers. They didn't want containers in Nova. They thought they had too much on their plate. They thought they were too uh, involved in what they were doing to really get involved in container technology. So I didn't actually travel to the Paris Summit because I hate international travel and I avoid it if I can. Um, so it was probably good because I guess the session was really negative. There was a lot of negativity in the session around having containers at all in OpenStack. Uh, from the Nova Core and also from the community. People kind of thought maybe we don't need containers in OpenStack, maybe that's outside the scope of OpenStack. Um, so I disagree with that uh, and kind of shift forward a few months after Paris, um, I started getting involved in Magnum. Now Magnum didn't exist at all. There was, there was a name of a project, but there was no code in any repository. So I, I went to Adrian and I told Adrian uh, and another person, Daniel, uh, that uh, we would come and work on Magnum, and I had a vision for what Magnum should be, and I would help implement that and drive the implementation and build the community around that. And he, the, my only condition was that he was PTL, he would become the PTL of the project. And he said, okay, if you can do that, knock yourself out, I'm, I'm game. So that's how Magnum got started. Uh, during that kind of first month, there was about 100 commits to the repository, and that really attracted a lot of new developers from a lot of different companies. So I'll get to that. That was actually our vision. So that really attracted kind of what you see here in terms of the developers. Now, excuse me for my back here, I just want to point out, these are all individual contributors here. Each of these little diagrams, are these are people's names if you can't see the others here. This is key, so what, what, are, what does others represent? That represents this pie here, this 20% of people that contributed to Magnum uh, on behalf of these various companies. Now, one of the cool things about, if you looked at this diagram, this 20%, well, how many people are there? I'll get to that in a moment, but if you look at the companies that are involved, they're all big companies, and they all have very kind of small contribution levels to the code base, so it makes Magnum very diverse. What's cool about this property is that if any of these contributors have walked away from Magnum, Magnum would still survive. I think that's a great, great, spectacular feature of Magnum, something that a lot of communities in open source try to, try to achieve but don't necessarily do, and that's one of the cool things that we have. In terms of statistics, um, so we've done about 2,100 patch sets. Now, patch set is something that somebody submits to our Garrett review system for review, but is not actually committed to the repository. A commit is when something is committed to the repository. There we have about 600 commits. This is during the Kilo cycle, which was a six-month cycle. If you look at that ratio, it's about one to three. That means each review goes through about three iterations before it hits the repository. Some go through more, some go through less. This guy's over there, or ladies, does it maybe? We've uh, developed about 100,000 lines of code during this time, which is really huge. The really cool thing is, somehow, magically, we man managed to attract 42 developers to work on this project out of nowhere, out of all these various companies' um, kind of systems. 
these 42 developers have contributed to Magnum kind of of their own accord or maybe their management wants them to contribute, who knows the reason. But what's really cool about that is that's a huge contribution. 42 people, think about that, 42 people in six months. What could you do with 42 people in six months? Well, you get this output, you get 100,000 lines of code, and you get a containers as a service solution, which is what Magnum is. Uh, 42, magic number, I like that. That's pretty cool. And just kind of worked out randomly like that. So in terms of differentiators, so Magnum is multi-tenant in the control and data planes. And really what that means is it's secure. So the control plane is secure from attacks by other tenants. So another tenant can't interf inter interfere with the control plane of another tenant. And also the data plane is secure. The way we do that is by using Neutron, which is an OpenStack project for networking. The data plane is secure from attacks by different tenants. So a tenant is something in OpenStack where there's a specific user, and then maybe there's a different user with a different set of projects, and, and we don't want those two tenants to be able to interact with each other. So Magnum is first on the multi-tenant part of side of things. And what that really offers us is um, it offers good isolation in, in our security model. So our API is asynchronous. What that means is an asynchronous API is one that, where you make a call and it returns immediately, and then you, re, you go out and query it for its changes later. Uh, we're kind of first here as well in the containers as a service space. In fact, we're first in containers as a service in general. Um, now, we use OpenStack Heat for our orchestration layer. Uh, some people might say, okay, maybe we can just uh, re-implement orchestration. I'll get into a diagram of what parts of Heat we use and how we use different parts of OpenStack with Heat later. But we're definitely the first to use OpenStack orchestration for containers as a service. Finally, we use OpenStack Identity Keystone Service for single sign-on, and that single sign-on allows, uh, provides a security model for our multi-tenancy uh, control and data plans. The key point is we're first. So there's a Magnum architecture diagram. I'm going to have to turn my back to you again, excuse me, once again. I'll start over here on the controller node. We've got the bay up here. Now a bay, what is, what is a bay? A bay is an abstraction we created in Magnum. A bay consists of multiple nodes. That's this thing right here, the node. A node is a virtual machine. So for example, we could create a bay with three virtual machines. That would allow us to launch containers over that bay that has the three nodes in it. And those containers would be launched over those three virtual machines. Now, realistically, we can launch maybe 100, 200 VMs before things start to go haywire. So, it's, we're not really limited to three, we're more limited to one or 200 VMs, which is still pretty scalable. Um, the next thing in this diagram is a pod. Now, a pod is a Kubernetes abstraction. What a pod is is a collection of Docker containers that are co-located in one space and share a common set of resources. This is a Kubernetes construct. If you understand Kubernetes, this will make sense to you. If you don't, uh, it's probably beyond the scope of this talk for me to explain a pod. But it's our way of abstracting Magnum's or uh, Kubernetes pod structure into Magnum. So the next abstraction we have is something called a bay model. So a bay model is a profile. When you create a bay, there's a bunch of stuff that goes into creating a bay. Things like what kind of flavor you want, uh, what this SSH key should be, and various other things. Uh, so you don't want to have to specify this over and over every time you create a bay, because we want people to be able to create multiple bays so they can have multiple sets of isolation for their applications. That way they get multi-tenancy for their applications. So a bay model allows us to define it one time, define what the bay should look like one time, and then when we create the bay, we reference the bay model when we create that bay. Now that goes, that leads to a service uh, object. Now a service object is another Kubernetes construct that we offer. It just abstracts Kubernetes services and uh, again, if you don't know Kubernetes in detail, it's kind of beyond the scope of my talk. Uh, but what that allows is for us to abstract Kubernetes at the Magnum layer so people in OpenStack can integrate with Kubernetes. And then finally, there's an RC, which stands for Replication Controller. <clears throat> now, what can you do with all these things? Well, one thing you can do is you can use heat to orchestrate your replication controllers, your pods, and your services, 
And what that, rep, what that orchestration allows with heat, using Magnum, is to control the orchestration of your container solution. So right now Kubernetes, when it runs, um, one of the problems it has is you start up all the pods all at once, and there's no control or ordering or anything. It just starts and you kind of hope everything works out. That's how the Kubernetes architecture expects things to be. We think in proprietary software, in a lot of cases, upstream we think this, in proprietary software, if you've got a database, you're not going to be able to get it to operate in that model. Or if you've got some other application, you're not going to be able to get it to operate in that model. So this model is a way for people to integrate with OpenStack their proprietary applications and containers in a way that is re repeatable and is functional. So yeah, there's the, uh, there's the Magnum API. So all of, these serv all of these abstractions are in this component called the Magnum API. That leads to this thing called the Magnum Conductor. These communicate together over a service called AMQP, which is just a RPC interface. And then inside the Magnum Conductor, there's heat templates. So there's heat templates for both Fedora and CoreOS, and both for Kubernetes and Swarm. So if you multiply these together, you end up with like 16 different kinds of variations of bays and operating systems you can create. We want to support Ubuntu as well. We want to support Mesos as well. So those are some of the things we want to do in the future. This is what the Magnum Conductor does. It takes that template, passes it to our template handlers, which then communicate with the OpenStack Heat and database. And then OpenStack Heat is what creates the virtual machines that represent the bay. And as part of that creation, they contact Nova and ask Nova to create a bunch of VMs, which are nodes again, just nodes. It asks, Nova, it asks Heat to create those VMs for us in that bay based upon the bay model we defined. And it does that over here, excuse my back again. Uh, it does that by contacting CloudInit internally inside the VM, and then CloudInit runs our heat config elements, which are these things in the templates over here. Now, that goes down to Docker and communicates with Docker, and Docker depends on a micro OS. So that's our architecture in a nutshell. Um, I'd be happy to answer questions towards the end on our architecture if people have them. I know I went over that a bit fast, but I think that covers that pretty well. So, what is our roadmap? Well, when we do open source, we define our roadmap in terms of what the community wants to work on. Not necessarily what customers always want, but it's really what people want to work on. Uh, it's also based upon customer input, so we have this big thing, big shindig every year, uh, twice a year actually, called OpenStack Developer Summit. A bunch of developers get together, I think there were 6,000 this year. They get together and define what the next version of OpenStack should be, and it kind of evolves over the next six months. We're, we're in the Liberty cycle right now. Uh, it follows an ABC naming convention, so we're on L release of OpenStack. Uh, we got together and we defined our roadmap, and our, our, our first most important roadmap item is to make Magnum deployable by operators. Right now, if you were to deploy Magnum as an operator, you'd probably be disappointed. So Magnum, we really expect to be kind of production worthy and ready for deployment after Liberty is completed, so when the Liberty cycle concludes. Um, we want something called native client support. So you saw there that I showed that there's, that we, in our uh, API, we support pods, replication controllers, and services. A native client is something that comes from a vendor such as Google with Kubernetes or Docker with their Docker API. And you can communicate directly with Magnum bays that are created from bay models using that native client API and using the native tools you're familiar with. So this is something we're gonna add. We still wanna keep the pods, the replication controllers, and the services for kind of the use case of proprietary software doing or com complex orchestration upstream. That's what we want. But we also recognize that people want to, want to control their, their Kubernetes or Swarm systems, which is what Magnum abstracts. It abstracts both of those systems very well. Uh, they want to control that with their native clients in many cases, so we're going to support that. That's something I'm actually working on uh, at the moment. Uh, another big key for us, th these are like a, kind of the top four, I'll cover the top four first, is TLS client server auth. So right now, when you use either Swarm or Kubernetes, you can communicate with Swarm or Kubernetes 
there's no authentication as Magnum stands today. So that's not good because somebody in a one tenant can affect another tenant. Now we have multi-data, we have multi multi-tenant multi control in data planes, but this is one area where we have a gap. And we have probably three or four people in the community working on this now as we speak. And uh, I expect big progress here. This is, this is one of our most important items to solve. Once this item is solved, I think Magnum will be deployable in the Liberty cycle. Uh, so if we did nothing else but just solve this problem, you as a cloud operator could deploy Liberty today. If you're not a cloud operator, you could use, you could use Magnum as a user as well. So that's kind of what that TLS uh, client server auth is about. Uh, native Neutron port support, this is kind of purely an optimization. If you look at the way we use our system today, um, when we create our bays and within those VMs, we use a tool called Flannel. Flannel introduces memory copies, which introduce latency to the network operations. We want to reduce that latency. It doesn't impact throughput, but if you think about how latency affects the system, what happens is memory copies are increased, CPU utilization goes up, your machines have less CPU availability to do work. So we want to reduce that CPU utilization, and that also reduces our latency. So this is an optimization that we want to tackle. The community was really big on this point. Uh, we had like two sessions on this, which was pretty un un atypical for, a, for an OpenStack session. Um, next thing is Horizon integration. This is the next thing on deck. Horizon integration is, Horizon is a dashboard for OpenStack. I don't know how familiar you are with OpenStack, but Horizon allows you to have a GUI around OpenStack. Uh, right now, there's no GUI around Magnum. Uh, we see this as a gap because we think administrators want self-service in many cases, and they want to be able to, to, to administer or control what happens in Magnum inside of a, a GUI dashboard. So this is another key roadmap item for us. And then uh, horizontal scalability. So we've determined upstream we don't need horizontal scalability uh, for scalable reasons. We need it for HA reasons. So. So what we want to do with horizontal scalability is we want to be able to scale out that API. That's a process. That Magnum API is a process. We want to be able to run multiple copies of that. And that Magnum conductor, we want to be able to run multiple copies of that. And we want everything to work correctly when we do so. Right now, we can run multiple APIs, but not multiple conductors. So we're working on that upstream. Without that, if one of those conductors or APIs were to die, which is one-on-one -on -one, as it is today, uh, then your system would stop working, you'd have downtime, and you'd lose availability, that's a bad thing. So we want to avoid that, so we need to fix that problem. Functional gating is something that we've really tried to tackle in the last release in Kilo, and we're really improving on it in this next release. Uh, we're really going to crank up the notch on what is required for new code to go in, and part of that's going to be functional gating of the new code contributions. And what we want to do with functional gating is OpenStack is fantastic at having great unit tests. We have, we have like 90% code coverage of our code base with unit tests inside of Magnum. But if you look at our functional tests, we have like 40 or 30% coverage. I'm not really sure, it's, it's very low. So we want to crank that up to 80 or 90%. So, so what comes out at the end is very good and people can rely on the gating. And then of course we want full OpenStack style documentation. Uh, this is to follow best practices in the OpenStack community. Um, so that's, that's essentially our roadmap in a nutshell. So at this point, I'll take any questions folks have. There's a mic here coming around the room if you have questions. So um, do you have any plans to implement uh, Maginum for other kind of container technologies like Rocket or LXCT? Yeah, so that's, that's a wonderful question. Uh, I guess I left this out in my presentation that I, I should have covered this, but one of the key goals of Magnum was to avoid the uh, Docker versus Rocket versus whatever decision. We just accepted that the container orchestration engine was where the battle was going to be in terms of what people are going to want to make choices about. And how, how things work underneath, we think 
uh, upstream, we think that those container orchestration engines are going to make individual choices. So we just ignored that battle entirely. We don't care about that problem, particularly. What we care about is that container orchestration layer, which is what Magnum focuses on. So we abstract Swarm, Kubernetes, and Mesos in the future. Uh, so we don't, we, we're not really interested in what, how containers are, are controlled individually by those orchestration engines. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, is there somewhere I can go to see more of this in action, maybe an example of, of what you can do with, with Magnum and to get more info like that? Could you speak more into the mic? Is there somewhere I can go to maybe see a little bit more of what I can do with Magnum? Do you have a demo or something like that that, yeah. that you can show here? Sure, that's a fantastic question. So uh, we have a demo pod set up um, today from 3 to 5 and tomorrow from 9 to 12. I'll be happy to show a demo of both Swarm and Kubernetes running, and you can see how it operates. Um, you can see how the different uh, APIs work and how the different uh, REST clients work and get an idea of what the system does and how it operates. I think that's the best way to see it is to experience it or to try it out yourself if you really are kind of interested in trying DevStack. But if you're not, certainly the demo pod is a great way to kind of do that. Okay, well, if there's no more questions, I'll conclude. And uh, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, I found it valuable, and I hope you did as well. Thank you very much. That was great.